Hey folks, this is Andy Powell of Wishbone Ash. The story is very interesting actually because we were getting ready for a big um, American tour and uh, I've been playing Gibson guitars but um, I was looking around for something new and I walked to this store in Denmark Street and um, it was orange and I, what caught my eye it really was a guitar that was shaped rather like this Gibson Flying V and I started playing this guitar and I, I just saw this orange gear everywhere and I said can I plug this thing into something? Obviously, this is the equipment you said, so I didn't know anything about Orange. And number one, the guitar was amazing. They were one of only two uh, Flying Vs that were in the country that time in London for sale. So I really liked the guitar, but I really liked the sound of the gear. And um, we were kind of in the market for buying a new backline of, of, of equipment. And so we made the two purchases in one day, a guitar and, and uh, a rig. And actually, this amp here is one of the is one of it's the first amp that I bought at that time. Well, Denmark Street was the hub of uh, for musicians. That was um, it was where you met other musos. It was where you would maybe form bands. There were rehearsal rooms there. There were um, uh, guitar shops. And you know this goes back to like the 50s, and we would be down there because we worked with a design company that designed all of our album sleeves, a company called Hypnosis. And so they had a little studio garret room above the musical stores in uh, Denmark Street. And we would go up there and we would uh, plan out our um, album covers and actually do photo sessions up there and stuff. But you know the Orange Shop came along a little bit later. I mean, the thing that set it apart, obviously, was the, the store itself looked fantastic. It was orange. It was this giant logo, which just fitted in perfectly with um, what was going on. I mean, we were, we'd gone through the British blues boom. We'd had psychedelia. Cream had come along. They disbanded. Um, there was this feeling of like, what next? And so, you know, to have um, a store that looked like it was catering for what was going to come next was incredible. It wasn't that big of a store, but you know, because orange was everywhere, you, you, you kind of felt a little bit intimidated. It was, it was a brave move, you know, because um, you were working um, with equipment that was going to stand the test, make the grade against um, the big boys of the time, or the American manufacturers and British manufacturers that already had a 10 year head start, 20 year head start. So it was pretty exciting. We were all massive Fleetwood Mac fans, and of course, Fleetwood Mac was the other band that bought Orange equipment, along with Stevie Wonder. There was three of us that took that gear to America. And uh, it was a perfect timing for us because we were going from playing small clubs and theaters in the UK to playing big stadiums. In fact, the first show that we did in America was opening for The Who at the Mississippi River Festival in front of 35,000 people. So to have this very new English equipment that was uh, very powerful and clear. The most important thing I noticed about Orange was the clarity of the, the sound. Uh, beefy, lots of punchy mid-range to it, like beautiful bell-like high-end and, uh, and we used to take this on the stages in America and the, um, the people running the sound rigs and the PAs were just like, what is that? Firstly, it looked bizarre because being Orange, I mean, all gear was black. That was the de facto, that was the thing, black gear. So to have orange gear was a very clever marketing thing. So everyone noticed the gear, you know. We got to St. Louis and th at this point we had everything in a, what they call a semi truck, an articulated uh, lorry, a truck, uh, 18 wheeler. And in the middle of the night, it's outside of our hotel, that somebody came and very kindly stole the entire truck and, and all the equipment and our guitars and um, and that was it we we we, we lost the gear and um, we eventually we managed to replace things uh, you know duplicates and so forth but we lost the original gear and then this amp bizarrely turned up um, out of the blue about 30 years later I was playing again in St. Louis and somebody 
sheepishly came up to me at a show, a very small show at that point, and said, I think I have one of your amplifiers. And he showed me this amplifier, which looked a little bit like this, but it had all the front taken off. It was disguised. They tried to disguise uh, the orange label, everything on there, the logo. Uh, but I knew it was my amp. And then I, he gave me the amp bag. It was very, I don't think he'd stolen it, but he had received it as stolen goods. So I took it back to my home in Connecticut, stayed in my garage for about 10 years. And then I, I met some people, uh, a guy called Chris Husband from Vancouver, who turned me on to an amp guru called Ed Johnson down in Texas, Dallas, Texas. And he refurbished the, the amp and I started to use it. The interesting thing was that I knew the sound. It was, it was back in my memory and in my touch. And as soon as I started playing Orange again, I thought, oh my God, that's our sound. And everybody's been coming up to me on this tour and saying, wow that's like that is the sound of the band we you were always close before but this has brought it right back this thick punchy sound that we get on stage which is at the same time very it's got a lot of fidelity so that's been just a real joy for me to realize that something that i picked up on you know almost four decades ago five decades ago um, still stands the test of time and sounds even better than ever i'm also using the brand new rock of verb 100s which are very comparable actually and it's, it's our sound. I mean, it's the sound that made Wishbone Ash, the twin lead guitar sound. Um, it's very important with two guitarists playing lead to have clean, clear sound with a nice, you know, gruff edge to it and um, plenty of punch so that when, you know, we both go on to lead guitar playing, um, there's no rhythm guitar behind us, but we don't need it. The sound is full. And uh, we can play these dual lead lines with this equipment and it just, that's the sound that made the band. So Wishbone, Ash and Orange, and Flying these. <laughs> it's a great story, a marriage made in heaven. There was another band in Britain called Blossom Toes, and that was with Jim Cregan, and they dabbled a bit with twin lead stuff. So um, it wasn't an entirely fresh concept, but I, I would say, I would venture to say that we probably took it further than any other band, and have subsequently influenced bands like Thin Lizzy and Iron Maiden and those kind of classic rock outfits, you know. Um, but you know, we we kind of we're, we were in a way we were like a the way that modern jam bands are. It was the way that Wishbone Ash was back in the day. So we were eclectic. We take music from anything that we were hearing. You know, it could be folk rock, could be art rock, could be progressive. I mean, we did a lot of jazz tinged things. And again, the Orange was great for that because of the clarity and. Uh, so we, we just found that we were able to try, our music became a, an eclectic mix of all those influences and those bands that we enjoyed, you know. Uh, well, you know, every decade had its thing. I mean, guitars were quite out of fashion in the 1980s, because that's when synths came to the fore. And every, everyone thought the guitar was going to disappear. So we had to kind of like adapt a little bit, lie low. Um, you know, there was punk music came along. But every decade, we were able to take something from it and incorporate it in our music. And in the same way with different uh, musicians that joined or left the band, everyone would leave their stamp on the music. And because we were never particularly a, a well-known band producing singles, we weren't rooted in any one decade. So it's, I always think that's part of the, de the, the longevity of the band, is the fact that you know, we, we weren't, you know, when you have a hit single, you're rooted in that particular decade. And we've been able to be a player's band, really. We're coming up to 50 years as a uh, recording and uh, gigging entity. So it's, it's something I'm proud of. Wondering why your face no longer shines. You know, our, our audiences range from sort of 15 to 65, 70 even. Um, and one really interesting thing is the, uh, the latest um, partner I have on guitar, Mark Abrams. He actually first heard this music from his father when he was nine. He's a lot younger than me. And so it was almost printed into his DNA. And when he came of age, I mean, I knew him for a while. He was running a music store, in fact, selling orange gear. And, um, you know, that is hugely rewarding to have an impact on younger crowd, you know, as well as um, people my age, you know. <laughs> 